Hello, History 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. This is the second half of the Lecture 11 video. I would like to go back to a quote that I had in the Closing the Gaps lecture and then in quiz number nine. People do not make history under circumstances chosen by themselves. Some of you thought that this was something said by the Sioux, which is not the case. The scholar writing, Osler, quotes that bit to describe the situation of the Sioux. They were not just passive recipients of violence, but nor were they in control of every situation. We are going to look at this quote and a little historiography before I get into part two proper. But this lead-in relates very much to the discussion in the bulk of the lecture. Osler was actually quoting from an essay by Karl Marx. Marx starts well here by observing that we now do not have all choices open to us. Men, and we'll let him go on that one for a moment, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted from the past. We are working all the time within a matrix produced by the history that comes before us. No matter what choices I make or how many bootstraps I break, I am never going to hold a place in society like that of Taylor Swift. And I cannot stop Russia from invading the Ukraine, even if I join forces with other like-minded folks. At the same time, I'm not just floating on a stream like a leaf. I get to make some choices with the expectation of certain results. And I'm fairly lucky. The choices that I was able to make were more open to me as a white woman of my generation than they were to many others born at the same time. It is true that I did not have all of the choices that white men around me had, but my choices were also not limited to committing every moment to overthrowing the patriarchy or supporting it. Yet it seems sometimes like these are the only choices open to the histories of marginalized groups. Do nothing or revolt. That's not the way that people work in most circumstances. It's not the way that we were, unless you think that listening to this lecture now so that you could get a degree makes you nothing but a prop in a bigger, more important story. In the same essay that the quote came from, Marx himself walks into this trap by asking for revolution that somehow changes everything with no residue of the past. Marx was incredibly good at analyzing his society's past and present, but he could no more predict a future not arising from that past and present than we can. So to quote Marx, the social revolution of the 19th century cannot draw its poetry from the past, but only from the future. It cannot begin with itself before it has stripped off all superstition in regard to the past. You can't draw from the future. You can't know the future. Marx also could not predict how later historians would respond to his influence. I am, of course, oversimplifying in the following description, but this reflects trends in studying history. If you think about the big men and battle history of the 19th century, ordinary people were like toy soldiers. They played out the action, but otherwise they didn't matter. They didn't make history. Then came the, well, of course they mattered. Look how horribly the people more powerful than they were treated them. If you think about this, it's really in some ways the same story. The Native Americans seem to have just been destroyed, the enslaved seem to have waited around for the Civil War, and with a few great women exceptions, women happily or unhappily did laundry until they woke up in the 19th century. I actually overheard a young man in a class I sat in on a few years ago say to a friend, why would we want to study women's history? It's all just washing clothes at the riverbank, who cares? Then historians started thinking about agency marginalized people still make choices. So the original idea of agency was just overcoming 
the prejudice that had been formed that people could be not important or not quite people. That was agency. But in short order, all of those choices began to be framed as acts of resistance. If you think about it, this still makes the people in power responsible for all of the actions of the people with less power. Their lives completely consist of resist or not resist. The big wigs are still making the story and the choices that count. The little folks are still largely acted upon. Native Americans just resisted on the way to being pushed away, and labor activism must always be a precursor to better labor activism so that we have a story of progress. In the agency story, marginalized people are in a constant state of resistance. Every action is calculated to undermine the dominant paradigm. There is a solid foreseeable goal that reflects the values of the historian. What Osler was trying to get at in quoting Marx was that none of the views I've just described adequately reflect the complexity of history. Understanding historical context means understanding the choices that were actually available to real people in the past, but remembering that they were still people still making choices, just not ones that would always fit into a simple narrative of progress or failure as judged from our own time. Our version of a best choice can only exist in hindsight. This doesn't mean that we cannot cast judgment on decisions made in the past, like deciding to slaughter a village full of people at Sand Creek. But it does mean that we can look at those who were slaughtered as not just props to an inevitable story of white American domination, but as people whose actions and decisions also shaped the world in history, even if that was not at the top of their mind at every moment. History is a study of people in the past. People in the past, all people in the past, made choices and did things that affected history. While limited in parameters and choices by our history and the structures of power around us, we are still human and we are constantly making choices and doing things that are important to us and to making history, even if the folks in the future are not interested. We do not live lives that consist only of being acted upon or fighting larger forces. Ostler and other historians like him are trying to find narratives that reflect humans rather than some superimposed narrative like conquest or resistance that leads inevitably to us now. And that's actually really difficult. I struggle with it myself, clearly, because I already know just how everything ended for folks in the past. Spoiler, all the characters die. But because I can only look at what did happen, the stories I tell are in those terms, and they always seem to be heading toward a knowable end point, our now. That was a long intro, but it matters because I'm amazed by how often we fall back into the narratives that we have been taught. The melting pot led to good, the goodness that is us now, or at least the goodness that we must be heading toward. Union action may have failed, but it laid inevitable groundwork to us now, so overall it's okay. There really was a traditional family in which women were confined to the home to twiddle their thumbs or maybe do the laundry, and they weren't really enlightened until they started doing stuff like wearing short skirts in the 1920s or creating unions in the first decades of the 20th century. So when we head into part three here, try to avoid the view that many of us are taught directly and indirectly that at least women are doing something important in my terms, or at least these women did something that mattered. Historian Nell Irvin Painter has observed, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the numbers of women who worked for wages outside the home challenged the assumption that women were naturally and exclusively homemakers. 
In 1900, of the nearly five and a half million women in the U.S. who worked for wages, around 932,000 worked in the clothing and garment trades or in textile mills. Around 2 million were domestic servants. Others were farm laborers, teachers, or sales clerks. Many working women were young, poor, and unmarried. But in 1900, 21% of the female population over 16 worked in wage labor, married or not. Married women in the Northeast often took in sewing or piecework that could be done at home while caring for family, and children could be used to help out. But that is not always counted as working, even though they were paid for it because it wasn't a regular wage. Respectability was assessed differently by the working classes than by the middle classes, since staying at home an idealized home, was not an option. Respect was measured by forms of employment. Some jobs, like nursing and teaching, took years of study and had relatively high status. Although it was more difficult for them to get training, Black women certainly made careers as nurses and teachers. Following these, sales clerking was the next most respected. The pay was low and the hours long, but in department stores and boutique shops, these jobs required nice, respectable clothing and mainly went to wasp white Anglo-Saxon Protestant girls who spoke unaccented American English. Following this, different factory jobs commanded different levels of respect. While at the bottom of the hierarchy were domestic and service workers, often first-generation foreign immigrants, many of them Irish in the North, and Black women in the South. Domestic servants were often isolated, and especially, especially immigrants in the North who worked as domestic servants were often very isolated. And while wealthy and middle-class women took an interest in shop girls and factory women, they seemed far less inclined to worry about the girls and women who labored in their own homes. Nonetheless, these women all navigated their lives just as we do, trying to choose their own course in life within the parameters that shaped their world. Women worked industry jobs from the beginning of industry. And like any other group, they did what they could to make favorable changes, not always successfully. So in the 1830s and 1840s, the first industrial factory production in the U.S. was in textile mills, and women worked there from the very beginning. The so-called Lowell girls organized what were essentially strikes, as well as creating petitions to government in order to force mill owners to improve conditions. In 1866, Black women working as laundresses in Jackson, Mississippi, formed a union and conducted a strike for higher wages. In 1881, Black washerwomen in Atlanta, Georgia, also formed a union and conducted a strike for higher wages. I use the images that are on the screen now because in the age of washing machines, I think that it is easy to drastically underestimate the sheer amount of work that it took to do laundry. You have already heard of Lucy Parsons in connection with Haymarket, the Haymarket Affair. She was also active in the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW or Wobblies. She helped to found the International Working People's Association, IWPA, and she was an influential organizer for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, ILDWU. In 1888, the Knights of Labor, unlike the AFL that would follow them, the Knights admitted women. Leonora O'Reilly organized a women's chapter of the Knights, naming it the United Garment Workers of America. These names all start to sound kind of similar, so I, I will never test you on the specific names. Just know the general pattern. When we get to the time period of Module C here, factory women formed organized labor groups like so many others in the working classes and like generations of working women before them. 
The difference was in the scale of industry, just as it was for men's use unions of the period. Some of these groups or unions crossed class lines, as, for example, the Women's Trade Union League, or WTUL, which brought together middle-class reformers and factory union members, and it was formed in 1903. These cross-class alliances were not always entirely comfortable. In language which is familiar now, middle-class members were called allies. They could use their money and privileged connections to help, but they could also sometimes be patronizing and not actually listen to the needs of working women. After the Knights of Labor, women's unions also had trouble coordinating with major men's unions, like the American Federation of Labor, or AFL. The issue here was that men who bought into the male breadwinner female homework homemaker model needed their wives and daughters to work, but they did not really want to help those wives and daughters to make living wages of their own. Working class men felt that doing so would lower their own status. In other words, many, by no means all, but many of these men bonded by sex well before they bonded by class. The International Ladies Garment Workers Union was formed in June of 1900 by 11 delegates representing local unions from major garment centers in New York City, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Newark. So notice that this is building on a structure of unions that's already there. The local unions already counted over 2,000 workers, most of whom were Jewish immigrants, and many of whom had already engaged in socialist and trade union organizing in Europe before coming to the U.S. The idea of the ILGWU was to increase the effectiveness of labor actions by bringing together local unions, not always an easy matter. Before presenting a unified phase, differences of concern between unions in the same cities had to be worked through. So the earliest labor actions were largely smaller shop strikes and membership drives. The early ILGWU also had to fight court injunctions against unions, the most critical of which in the early years was that against the cloakmakers local of Racine, Wisconsin. Not too surprisingly, the ILGWU faced intense pushback from manufacturers. We will come back to the garment workers, but first we'll take a look at the relationship between trade unions of women workers and the issue of women's suffrage or the vote for women. It was not lost on labor organizers that not having a voice in government hampered the cause of gaining improvements in working conditions. It was also clear that the idea of public sphere versus private sphere was a complete hindrance, not to mention a lie. Working women were already in the public sphere. If they brought piecework or laundry home, then their private sphere became the public sphere. And if they worked in someone else's home as a maid or cook, then their public sphere work took place in someone else's private sphere. The Equality League of Self supporting women was formed by working class women in 1907. While the Equality League drew in upper class members, the leadership was working class, sort of the inverse of the WTUL. The Equality League quickly grew to 19,000 members. Perhaps the League's greatest accomplishment was the full integration of working women into suffrage activity, especially due to two working class leaders, Schneiderman and O'Reilly. Again, turning to historian Nell Urban Painter, quoting, because so many Black women were poor, Black women's organizations were particularly sensitive to the interests of women who worked outside their own homes. Black women's organizations, such as the National Association of Colored Women, 
the National Federation of Afro-American Women, and the Northeastern Federation of Colored Women's Clubs worked for suffrage, the vote, along with white women, even though the white suffragists be betrayed a good deal of racial prejudice. What united working class women to the degree that they did unite was the need to set aside ideals of respectability as defined by the middle class, including the doctrine of separate spheres. Tactics from working women's, black and white, own culture, combined with labor tactics used in Europe, led women's organizations to put together demonstrations, street corner speakers, and torchlight parades, so not just strikes. Suffrage agitation and labor movements were inextricably linked and stretched across vectors of marginalization, including class, race, and sex, albeit always with a certain degree of uneasiness. Returning to the International Ladies' Garment Workers Union, or ILGWU, in the union's first decade, they organized major strikes in Boston and New York City. Between 1905 and 1907, reefer makers went on strike in New York City several times. Reefer has a number of meanings now. So to clarify what this had to do with garment makers, a reefer in this context is basically what we would call a peacoat now. In the last of the reefer maker strikes, more than 1,200 workers walked out in New York City in March of 1907. Working class women faced the same levels of violence as men from groups like the Pinkertons when they went on strike. Employers and their hired thugs did not hold back because the strikers were female. Despite the violence, women workers stayed with the strike and won major concessions from the owners, Reefer Manufacturers Association, including hiring union members, limiting the work week to 55 hours, abolishing subcontracting for pressing work so they couldn't hire people who would take like really, really small wages, and actually providing workers with materials and equipment rather than forcing them to purchase these themselves. So say for the reefer makers, they'd have to purchase their thread, their fabric, and their sewing machines, even though it was a company that benefited from these. In Boston, around 2,000 garment workers went on strike. They sought a 50-hour work week and union recognition. The ILGWU provided financial support to strikers because when you're out on strike, you're not making money, right? But most employers held out against the strike and a court injunction used the law to force workers to return to sweatshops. The Boston strike was considered a loss by the union, but both losses and wins brought workers to the international, as the union was called, resulting in more powerful strikes in later years. The most well-known strikes, for good reason, occurred in 1909 and 1910. Known as the Uprising of the 20,000, the strikes originated with shirtwaist makers, but came to be a cross-class undertaking able to last with financial injections from middle-class women. A shirtwaist is a blouse. All of the women in the image are wearing them, but it is easiest to see on the woman at the lower left whose jacket is open. Also note the headline given to the photo. This is from a newspaper. Girl strikers form band to fight thugs. Shirtwaists are, were made in hundreds of small factories and a few large ones in the New York, New Jersey region. Notable among the large factories were Lessersons and the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. These factories employed mainly young female Jewish immigrants, with some Italian men in higher paying positions, such as cutters, which is exactly what it sounds like, cutting fabric using paper patterns. 
the shirtwaist workers worked 10 to 12 hour days, in some seasons, seven days a week. Overtime pay did not exist. In other seasons, shirtwaist workers could be laid off with no protections at all. Women had to supply their own thread and often pay for their sewing machines, and they had to bargain for wages individually. In addition to unfair labor practices, shirtwaists were made in factories that filled with small bits of thread, cloth, and paper. Fires periodically broke out in these closed spaces filled with flammable debris. In 1909, the unions were just getting off the ground, so the major strike began with only a few women at the Triangle Factory who tried to form a union. They were quickly fired. While workers from both Lessersons and Triangle, as well as some of the smaller factories, joined the strike, the big companies hired men to beat up picketers, including the tiny strike leader, Clara Limlick, whose picture you see on the screen. Limlick, who came from what is now the Ukraine, returned to the picket line once her broken ribs had healed enough for her to move. This is one instance in which Society women put their bodies behind their words, joining the picket lines. This was actually remarkably successful. It was one thing for working class thugs and police to beat up and arrest working class women. It was quite another to approach women with money and social prestige. The same went for judges who had no problem hitting working class women with fines they could not afford to pay, but balked at finding wealthy women who might attend a dinner party with them later in the week. The full strike took shape in November of 1910, after a meeting at which Limlick spoke. It is called the Uprising of the 20,000, but in actuality, it involved more than 30,000. The strike was impressive and largely successful among the smaller factories where women did get improved wages and working hours limited to 52 hours per week. So notice that the reduction in hours is offset by the raise in wages by the hour. That said, large factories like Triangle were able to hold out. On 25 March 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory caught fire. Many of the doors were locked and there was no warning system. The women on the upper floors were faced with the decision of whether they wanted to jump from windows to certain death on the pavement below or die of smoke inhalation and fire in the factory. Owners and thugs might be okay with beating up working class women, and they often got away with it. There was no getting away from this. It was gruesome. It was clearly avoidable. There was no shooting, and the victims were all viewed with undiluted sympathy by the newspaper and the reading public. 147 people died in the Triangle disaster, almost all of them women in their teens, including two who were only 14. These were young women with families who had photos and whom the press sought out for juicy stories that sold papers. At the time, there were six bodies who could not be identified using the technology of the day. They have since been identified. You are looking at the crowd at the Triangle Funeral Parade. More than 140,000 mourners met on 5 April 1911 in Washington Square Park and marched up Fifth Avenue in a funeral parade in memory of the unidentified victims of the Triangle Fire. Nearly 250,000 onlookers lined the route. So what you are looking at here, the horses are pulling a carriage, and that carriage is a hearse carrying the co coffins of the unidentified women. The women's unions continued labor actions to raise awareness of working conditions and put pressure on owners. 
Three months later, after prodding from activists, not only from the working class, but from the middle class as well, New York's governor signed a law creating the Factory Investigating Commission, which had unprecedented powers. The commission investigated nearly 2,000 factories in dozens of industries and enacted eight laws covering fire safety, factory inspections, and sanitation. The following year, activists successfully pressed for 25 more laws, entirely rewriting New York State's labor laws and creating a State Department of Labor to enforce the laws. So if you think back, what you are seeing is a big change from the Supreme Court's Lochner decision. Clara Limlick was blacklisted, meaning she wouldn't be hired, by the Garment Industry Association. She became a full-time activist, founded a working-class suffrage group, fought for women's education, raised money for unions, and joined the Communist Party. She continued to support labor and social justice issues to the moment of her death, literally, in 1982. At her retirement home in California, Limlick, who is now Shavelson by her marriage, convinced the administration to support the United Farm Workers Produce Boycott, and she helped the nurses organize for union representation. Key points to Lecture 11. White Americans were aware of unrest in Europe. American factory owners actively resisted ideas like socialism, anarchism, syndicalism, and communism that might cut into their power and profits. Most middle-class white Americans did not differentiate these, but saw violence and unrest in Europe and feared the same in the U.S. Organizing and coordinating labor in the American West outside of cities presented unique challenges, mainly because workers were isolated at individual mines or logging sites. The International Workers of the World, IWW or Wobblies, were trying for overarching changes in American society that would improve conditions for all workers. The IWW did not discriminate based on type of labor, skill level, race, sex, or country of origin. The IWW used work and protest songs to link together people separated by both geography and the type of industry in which they were employed. The IWW was popular with workers, and it was extremely unpopular with industry owners, management, and some political figures. The United Mine Workers of America. UMWA became a well-coordinated and powerful union by the 1910s, claiming members in a large proportion of mines in the American West. The UMWA facilitated the 1913 to 1914 strike at the CF&I mines in Colorado owned by the Rockefellers. CF&I owners and management followed the pattern of refusing to meet with strike leaders, bringing in armed private police in the National Guard, and provoking violence. This resulted in the Ludlow Massacre, in which not only minors, but their wives and children were killed by the militia. This time, federal government forces moved in to end the violence but not to break the strike. The media and federal government were critical of Rockefeller's treatment of his workers. And this time, popular opinion generally stayed with the workers. The UMWA came through the strike stronger than before. J.D. Rockefeller Jr. seemed incapable of understanding that the strike was not just about material comfort, but self-representation on the part of the workers. Like many wealthy industrialists of his time, he focused on his own perspective, flatly refusing to treat employees like sensible adults and independent equals. 
women have worked in industry since the very beginning of industry. Women have also formed collective entities like unions to negotiate with employers for better terms since the very beginning of industry. Women in the so-called needle trades who worked in garment factories through the late 19th and early 20th centuries formed unions. These unions could be extremely effective, but they met with the same violent opposition from owners as men's unions. Working women's unions were also active in the push for women's right to vote. Beginning in 1909, women's unions, such as the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, ILGWU, organized a massive strike in New York City called the Uprising of 20,000 although it actually included closer to 30,000 strikers. The strike succeeded with all except a couple of the largest firms, including the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. In March of 1911, the Triangle Factory caught fire. There were inadequate, like none, safety measures, and the owners kept the doors locked during working hours, in total, 147 people died either directly from the fire or by jumping from upper stories to escape certain death in the fire. Most of the dead were young women in their teens and early 20s. The Triangle disaster made good copy for newspapers, and their sympathies were entirely with the workers, not the owners. The public was absolutely horrified by the Triangle disaster and successfully pressured the New York state and eventually the federal government to make laws requiring factories to undergo inspections and implement any safety improvements the inspectors required. I often find these lectures depressing to give and need to release my brain sometimes. My hobby time is spent on the meeting place of body, sex, society, and clothing. So the coda for this lecture is a straightforward presentation of the shirt waist. We often think of shirt waist as white because the images that we have are generally black and white, but shirt waist could come in many colors. Often they were pale, however. They generally narrowed at the waist with things like drawstrings or darts so that they could be worn tucked into skirts. This example on the slide from the 1890s has gathers at the back waist pleats in the front for decoration, and a tie from the back to the front, which would be hidden under the waistband of the skirt. Shirt waists were worn by everyone from the young women who made them to the uppermost classes, and they could be simple and tailored, or they could be completely frou-frou. The one on the left is 1890s, and you could tell this because the sleeves at the shoulders are puffed, even though the overall aesthetic of that particular garment is tailored. The shirt waist on the right is later in time from the first decade of the 1900s. This is a sleeve detail from the later shirt waist on the previous slide so that you can see the complexity of, it's called drawn work, white work, this the embroidery and the lace. Shirt waist, were worn over layers of clothing and often under a jacket so they could be made of quite sheer fabric as in this example from around 1907. The shirt waist shown here was made to be one of three parts of a high-end ensemble. So you could just see the top of the shirt waist and the sleeves of the shirt waist here. And then there's the dress over and the jacket can be worn over the dress. This ensemble is from Brooklyn and was made around 1902. This set was owned by someone who could afford designer clothing and matching sets. Most women would use a shirtwaist as we do a blouse now, mixing with different skirts and jackets to give the illusion of having more outfits than someone might actually have. This 
shirtwaist has just about every decoration possible, shirring, embroidery, pin tucks, and several types of lace. But you can see that the waist part made to tuck into the skirt is comparatively plain. This is the same piece from the back with another detail. The fabric has yellowed with age and wear, but it would have been white or close to it when it was first made. And one last view of the same one to appreciate the over-the-top decoration. This piece dates to 1905 and could be worn with a plain skirt and jacket or with an equally froof skirt. Full ensembles often do not survive, but this one did, and it shows what a full matching shirt waist and skirt might look like. I've also included a view of undergarments so that you can see what I mean by lots of layers. This is obviously an extremely high-end ensemble, and it dates to 1903. This suit or walking costume, as it was called at the time, dates to around 1908. You can see the lace shirtwaist at the neckline. And if we remove the jacket, we can see that even though the suit is quite plain, the shirtwaist is highly decorated, albeit monochrome, all in the same color. This example from 1910 has a much simpler shirtwaist worn with a somewhat snazzier suit. It may be difficult to see in the full view here, but this is the same shirtwaist in both images, but worn with two different suits. The next slide has closer views of the same outfits. These are both from 1911. And you can see that this neckline of the jacket is higher and the ruffles have been tucked in. So it looks much more plain. And here the closure is a little bit lower down and the ruffles have been pulled out to give a very different effect. And this is the skirt from the darker suit with a different shirt waist. You can see that they weren't all white as well as how sheer they could be and how they were worn over other layers of clothing that could show. This shirtwaist, also from around 1911, endeavors to split the difference between proof and simple lines. I will end on a group of women wearing shirtwaists while working on the production of shirtwaist. It looks like this particular image was taken at the pressing or ironing station. Let's see the irons there.